Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to Food Tank's exclusive webinar series. This is Sarah Small and I'm Food Tank's Global Events Director. Over the last few months we've had an amazing group of speakers including food waste expert Jonathan Bloom, urban forager Ava Chin, sustainable food expert Michael Tulusti, scientist Chuck Brenbrook, agronomist Jerry Glover, among many amazing other speakers. And today I'm really excited uh, and Patrick Holden will be joining us. He's the founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust. Before I get into what Patrick's going to talk about, I just want to let everyone know it's truly an honor to have him here. The Sustainable Food Trust mission is to promote international cooperation between all those involved in sustainable food production. Previously, Patrick served as director of the Soil Association. Uh, he studied bi biodynamic agriculture and started a community dairy farm in West Wales in 1973, which is now the longest established organic dairy farm in Wales. So Patrick will be presenting for about 30 minutes today. Then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A with our audience. This webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards. You can also follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank. And please submit your questions using the questions tab in your control panel. You can email sarah at foodtank.com or tweet your questions as well. So without further ado, Patrick, it's wonderful to have you here today, and I'm excited to hear your presentation. I'll give you the floor now. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone from Bristol, UK, although I suspect for most of you it's morning. Um, you can see in the background a picture of my cows because I'm a dairy farmer, and the picture you can see was taken last May um, on the top of my hill, uh, which is about 750 feet high, about 10 miles in from the West Wales coast. And in fact, I had a great privilege of um, seeing it from the air the other day when I was en route from um, London Heathrow to uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, and I just looked down from um, the 747 that was flying out towards the Atlantic and I could see the whole outline of my farm uh, which is the most amazing privilege because th this farm I've been looking after for over 40 years and I'd like to think that it looked just a little greener uh, from the land surrounding it uh, which I would also like to think is connected with the way that we've been looking after our soil which is of course relevant to um, what I'm about to discuss with you. Uh, the subject is true cost accounting uh, in food and farming and this is um, actually some slides that I prepared for the Food Tank Summit, uh, at which I spoke uh, just a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., but um, Food Tank didn't allow me to show these slides because that was the rule for the occasion, that everybody would just have to speak uh, from themselves. So yeah. you're seeing these, uh, um, these slides exclusively, um, even though they were prepared for the summit, which just took place a few weeks ago. Um, I've been trying to farm as sustainably as possible for many years. I actually started farming at the beginning of the 1970s and my entry into farming was connected with um, a year which I spent in California um, because my father was a visiting professor at Stanford University. Uh, of course that was a very interesting time to be in the Bay Area at the beginning of the 70s. I like to describe myself as having been radicalized there. Um, and I came back to the United Kingdom full of uh, conviction that we were on the edge of a, an ecological breakdown and that the only sensible thing was uh, to get back to the land mm -hmm. to farm sustainably and self-sufficiently. But we pretty soon found, this was a group of us that started on the farm, that when we uh, put our principles into practice, uh, it was quite hard for us to make a living because at that time, uh, all the crops that the farmers produced, in our case it was milk, but also the grains and the other crops were heavily subsidized um, and we were producing less because we weren't using any nitrogen fertilizer and pesticides and as a result we were making less money. So we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do would be to write down a prescription for sustainable agriculture and then take our story to the public, which we did, and they became the early drafts of the organic standards. And then I got involved, um, as Sarah just mentioned, uh, with the Soil Association, which is the leading organic farming and food organization uh, that subsequently did all the certification of organic food and farming. 
Um, for many years, I was uh, working for the Soil Association for 15 years as its director. And what we did during that time was we developed a separate market for the products from sustainable agriculture. And this was very successful in the sense that the market grew and grew and grew, although actually it has declined over the last uh, six or seven years in the United Kingdom due to the recession and other factors. But the problem was that the price premium that we had to put on our products, sorry about the phone going in the background, um, was so much that it limited the total size of the market uh, to around 5%, and that's being pretty um, optimistic about how big the market can grow. And the reason for that is because the farmers against which we were, if you like, competing, or the farmers who were adopting conventional production methods, who were using chemicals, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, pesticides, and other agricultural inputs, and of course uh, veterinary products, antibiotics, and other drugs to treat the livestock when they got sick, were causing damage to the environment and public health. But those, the costs of that damage were not reflected in the prices that the farmers were getting for their products or the prices that consumers were paying uh, for those same uh, products in the marketplace. So this gave the illusion that the most intensively produced food was the cheapest and sustainably produced food had to be a lot more expensive. In our case, uh, something like 20 or 30 percent more expensive than the conventional products uh, for milk. But the same is true with just about everything else, and maybe the biggest differential would be from an organically produced chicken, which might cost more than 100 percent, maybe even three or 400 percent more than the cheapest, most industrially produced chicken in the marketplace. Uh, but we didn't take any account of that at the time. We just thought that that was the way it had to be. But over the years, I thought more and more about this. And I thought, why is it that if you're a farmer, the best business case is to produce food as intensively as possible, because that will give you the best profits and the best return on your investment. Whereas the worst business case, as I've found, and still find farming in West Wales, um, in other words, it's much more difficult to make money if you're farming in a, a sustainable way, um, is for sustainable production. And conversely, if you're buying sustainably produced food or organic food in the marketplace, you're likely to be paying at least 20% more than if you were buying intensively produced food from industrial farming, which is causing all those downstream costs. So this led to a discussion between some of the leaders of the sustainable agriculture movement and this included Prince Charles, who took a very great interest in this and spoke about this subject at a conference uh, called The Future of Food at Georgetown University in May 2011, in which he pointed out that it was illogical and actually dishonest to have an economic system where the true costs of the damage to the environment and public health, which were resulting from our present food systems, weren't reflected in the price of the food. And I'm just going to go on to the um, uh, categories of these costs because what we realized was that it was important to have a proper study led by scientists, policy makers, representatives from NGOs such as um, Food Tank, where we collectively got together and we looked at all these damaging costs which economists call externalities. And if you see there on the screen, uh, we've got emissions. So if you use nitrogen fertilizer, for instance, um, there's a great deal of greenhouse gas emission from using it, mainly in the form of nitrous oxide, but also carbon dioxide and methane, of course. Then there's pollution of other kinds. This is groundwater, nitrate pollution, uh, phosphates in the water, and pesticides, which can cause damage to soil life animal manures, which can uh, themselves cause damage if you put them on the, the soil too heavily, and then heavy metals in the soils as well. And then there's the damage of, to biodiversity. Intensive farming makes it very difficult for wildlife to coexist both in the soil and on the edges of the fields. So intensive farming has massively affected the diversity of um, wildlife and plants growing uh, in amongst the crops we plant, as well as, of course, the impact on soil life, on 
insect diversity and on pollinators. And then moving on to some more categories of external costs from our present food systems, we've got the impact on so-called natural capital, that means the water um, which we are using uh, at greater than the capacity for the rain to replace it, we're using the so-called fossil water in agriculture, uh, we're also uh, mining the soil. The organic matter of soils has diminished dramatically um, over the post-war period because when you use nitrogen fertilizer it, it oxidizes the organic matter and when you grow arable crops year after year that also results in the uh, burning off the soil organic matter which has built, been built up by more sustainable farming practices over centuries. And then of course there's also the effect on minerals um, and on energy. Fossil fuels have been the main way in which we've been able to produce food so cheaply, but as we all know in terms of climate change, there's a cost uh, to the use of fossil fuel energy, and in any case it's running out. So we are diminishing natural capital, we're robbing nature's bank, as it were, to produce all this uh, so-called cheap food. And then possibly the largest hidden cost of all is the impact on human health, the impact on food quality and vitality, which uh, should be uh, the right of every person to consume healthy food which promotes their health, but because of changes in farming practice we've had reduced nutrient content, we've got antibiotic resistance which has come from the misuse of antibiotics in intensive livestock systems, we've got obesity and type 2 diabetes which are directly related to changes in farming practice, specifically the misuse of antibiotics which is on a vast scale in intensive livestock production, and we've got also now increasingly shown to be uh, links between heart diseases and cancers and infectious diseases, all of which are either directly or indirectly related to changes in farming practice over the last 50 or 60 years. And then finally, we've got the impact on society, on our cultural life, on our well being, on animal welfare, on jobs, on rural communities. All these impacts have not been priced in to the tag that we pay when we buy this intensively produced food, nor have they been reflected in the prices that farmers receive, therefore giving a completely false picture of the economics of um, sustainable farming uh, and giving the illusion that in fact um, sustainable farming uh, is expensive when in fact if you factor in all these true costs, then the picture will be reversed and actually it should be possible to buy uh, sustainably produced food at an affordable price, whereas intensively produced food, if you put all those prices onto the price tag, uh, you find you actually have to pay more for it. So I'm going to take an example now of nitrogen fertilizer. Now obviously the positive impact of nitrogen fertilizer, which is why farmers are using it, is if you buy a kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer, which will cost, I think, around a dollar, you're going to get increased productivity and yields and increased profitability. And this is a very rough rule of thumb. If you spend a dollar on nitrogen fertilizer, you're going to get a three dollar return in increased yields. So there is a good business case for using it. However, when you use that same dollar's worth of nit ammonium nitrate, which is likely what most farmers use, you're going to get high levels of emissions including nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. You're going to get the impact on biodiversity as I've just mentioned. You're burning up the soil organic matter. And then there's the hidden impact on human health uh, which is caused by nitrate pollution which is linked, has been linked to some stomach cancers and other uh, negative human health impacts. You've got increased pesticide use, nitrates in the drinking water, uh, which are themselves a, a major pollutant getting into the oceans and river water uh, eutrophication which is causing huge problems as, as everyone now knows in the Gulf of Mexico. Now no price has been put on those uh, negative impacts until quite recently when a European Union uh, based scientific study looked at these costs and tried to put um, a, a value on them and to sum it up, because there's a lot of uh, work being done on this, 
if you added up the cost of all that damage, at the very least, you end up end up with uh, three dollars uh, per kilo of uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which wipes out the profit for the farmer. But if you cost in all the more uh, disputed uh, aspects of it, it may even be as much as ten or even fifteen dollars of hidden costs to society as a whole and to us and to our health, resulting from each kilogram of, or dollars worth of nitrogen fertilizer used, which would wipe out the business case for using it altogether. So what we need to do is to do a comprehensive assessment of the costs and benefits of different farming systems. And armed with that information, we need to put a price on the damage caused or the benefit delivered and then work out how we can change the signals, the economic signals that farmers receive, so that if they are using um, methods of farming which are causing damage to the environment and all human health, they're picking up the cost for that at source, and conversely, if they're farming in such a way as I'm trying to do, which is beneficial to the environment, which builds up soil carbon, uh, which improves biodiversity, which is good for animal welfare, uh, which reduces the risk of antibiotic resistance, et cetera, et cetera, then I should get rewarded for doing that. And here's the uh, case study that I just suggested. Uh, a tonne of ammonium nitrate cost the farmer $387. The benefit to the farmer, depending on what crop you're growing, between $666 and $2,666 per tonne. The negative cost to society are between $990 and $5,000 per ton, thereby wiping out the benefit that the farmer is currently getting. And you can see it varies between the different crops. Now we come to what we could do about this. Let's supposing you put um, a tax on the nitrogen fertilizer in proportion to the damage done. You could then recycle that tax and pay it to farmers for being carbon stewards. So if we can work out how much carbon is laid down by sustainable farming practice, which use rotations uh, instead of continuous arable cropping, and we could measure that carbon content accurately, then there's no reason why we couldn't pay farmers in proportion to the amount of carbon in the form of organic matter that they fix in their soils, or by some means of assessing the impact of different farming systems if we can't actually measure it through something like a an app on our iPhone or something like that, and the technology doesn't yet exist to do that, although it may be developed in the next few years, we could then provide a real incentive which would shift the balance of economic advantage to farming uh, with the grain of nature in a sustainable way, building up soil carbon, which by the way, if everyone did it throughout the world, would actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere instead of the system at the moment, which actually encourages farmers to use practices which are directly causing emissions in climate change. We could also redirect the subsidies through the farm bill. There's no reason why uh, the farm bill, instead of subsidizing corn and soy as it does at the moment, or ethanol production, it, all that money, that, all those dollars that are going to the Midwest farmers in particular, couldn't be rechanneled into supporting a return to mixed farming where you could have the livestock grazing pastures instead of being shut up in feed, feed lots and the arable crops could either be fed to the animals or fed directly to humans uh, on the farms where this mixed uh, farming is going on. And then you can actually put a price on natural capital which is related to the above. For instance in Egypt at the moment um, the Farmers in Egypt who derive water from the Nile uh, don't pay for that water. The Egyptian government subsidizes it. So why not um, pay a proper price for the water? And then farming systems such as organic and biodynamic farmer that use less water uh, than conventional intensive farming, which is still the majority of the practice in Egypt, would have a better incentive to use less water than is the case at the moment. And the, so is the same is true for, for um, soil uh, preservation as well as I've just mentioned. Then you can have regulation and legislation, you can ban the most damaging practices altogether, or you could have legislation which makes sure in one way or another that people pay for their damage and are held legally accountable for it. You can also have market instruments, um, I mentioned the organic market earlier, that's a very good example of how farmers who are um, 
producing food in an organic or a sustainable way can um, charge more for it in the marketplace. But as I mentioned right at the beginning, you don't want to have that premium so high that it confines the availability of organic food to um, uh, a wealthy minority, because after all, it ought to be the right of everyone to be able to get access to sustainably produced health promoting food. And then another interesting uh, factor where you could find a way of incentivizing farmers to produce healthier food would be through some sort of risk assessment insurance. An example of this would be the um, health insurance companies who are having to pay to charge their customers ever higher premiums for health insurance when they know now that many of the diseases which are becoming so common now, I mentioned diabetes, um, obesity, cancers earlier, are directly or indirectly linked to changes in farming practice which, is, which have gone on really over the last few decades. And then finally, of course, you can educate people. People, if they have enough information, um, they will make informed choices about what kind of food they buy. And they can also act as pressure on the electorate uh, because that's important too. So, for instance, um, President Obama never talks about the need to shift the farm bill subsidies uh, so that they're benefiting sustainable producers. That's not because he doesn't privately believe that this is the case, but it's because, as I believe he was reported to have said a few years ago when the food movement people had a uh, discussion with him, he said, show me the food movement, I don't feel the heat. So in the end, it will be the power of informed public opinion which will drive politicians into reallocating the farm bill uh, to switch in favour of supporting sustainable um, farming practices. Now, I mentioned right at the top of what I've said uh, that on my own farm I've been trying to farm sustainably for many years and I continue to um, struggle to make ends meet financially. I'm lucky enough to have a day job um, but we are producing uh, cheese uh, from the milk of our 85 Ayrshire cows, that's a native breed from southwest Scotland, and we're doing everything as well as we can. We're recycling nutrients, we're building soil carbon, we're paying attention to, to uh, biodiversity. We haven't used any nitrogen fertilizer for over 40 years, as I mentioned, and yet the prices we're having to charge for our cheese are arguably uh, off putting. It's, it's become a niche product and a high end product. Uh, when, it, when in fact it ought to be available to everyone because well, it's not a, a fancy cheese, it's just a, a good uh, cheddar made in the right way in the way that all cheeses really should be made. But because of the absence of true cost accounting, we're having to compete against industrially produced cheese uh, which doesn't have a, such a good story behind it. Now that story on my farm, which is ongoing, is mirrored all over the world by farmers who would like to farm in a sustainable way and at present the only ones that can and do are those that are very good at on entrepreneurs and they have ways in which they can um, carve out a niche market for people who can afford their products or perhaps they've got no debt uh, or perhaps they're just so philosophically committed that they're prepared to farm and make little or no money at all. Now that needs to change because unless sustainable agriculture can become mainstream we're not going to address climate change, we're not going to address the, the reduction in soil fertility. There are so many pressing issues now where we need things to change. And one mechanism, which I didn't mention in that list of uh, incentives, uh, which is a sort of market in instrument, which I think is important, is the idea of introducing a fair trade label for products, uh, not just in developing countries like tea, coffee and bananas, but actually in so-called developed countries where when you buy the product you can know that there's a good social story behind it as well as good sustainable practice. So actually, in summary, there are so many ways in which we can take action to change the economic environment in which producers operate as a result of which the right financial sig signals will go to producers and consumers alike which will enable a transformation that at the moment, as Michael Pollan observed, in a conversation I had with him some two or three years ago, is confined to a maximum of 5% of total production uh, and transform it into becoming mainstream. 
So I'll stop there, and hopefully one or two of you who have been listening to this, uh, watching this, will have some questions and we can enter in, into a discussion about it. So Sarah, are you still with me, and uh, have you got anything that's come in so far? Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, that was really informative and really comprehensive as well. Uh, we do have some questions from listeners for the next 10 minutes or so. Let's go through as many as possible. I'd like to start by asking you a question from a listener. Uh, they write, who is currently working on determining the true cost of food in our food system? What organizations or where can eaters and consumers start to find this information? Well, I'll start with a, a well-known organization. Food Tank's taken an interest, taking an interest in this, which is excellent. Food Tank um, organized the conference at which I spoke in Washington, D.C., and I understand that you're doing some, the Food Tank are doing some work on this uh, field, so watch this space. The Sustainable Food Trust, also we are committing our organizational resources to take this project forward. Specifically, we are working with a man called Pavan Sukdev, who coined the phrase T, which is the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, which for the first time is an organized scientific project trying to put a price on nature and natural capital. But he came to a conference that we organized in London in December 2013, as a result of which he has instigated a new project, which is called TBAF, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity for agriculture and food, in which he has recognized that we need to include health externalities as well as the impact on, on nature and biodiversity and all the rest of it. Now that project is only in its early stages, but it's already attracted a major grant from the European Union and from a foundation on the West Coast. And uh, over the coming two or three years, we are hoping, I say we because I'm on the advisory board of this project, that it will eventually have an impact on public thinking on the scale of the Stern report, which brought to public attention uh, the importance of addressing climate change. So there is work going on, but we're only in the early stages because, as I mentioned right at the beginning, it's really quite recently that the scale of this economic distortion has come to public attention. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and the next question from a listener is, uh, how are bi biodynamic farmers part of the solution? Well, I'd better say a little bit about bi what biodynamic farming is. Um, it's based on uh, some lectures that a man called Rudolf Steiner gave uh, in 1924 to some um, farmers in the former East Germany who were noticing a decline in the vitality of their crops um, and their livestock. And uh, essentially, his lectures were all about organic farming, but he said that you need to take it specific, pay specific attention to the vitality of the crops and introduce um, practices based on an observation of the movement of the sun and the moon and the planets against the background of the zodiac, because planetary bodies themselves influence the vitality of plant growth and also to use certain homeopathic preparations to enhance the vitality of the soil and the crops. Now that may sound quite esoteric and out there, but in fact, interestingly enough, there's a revolution which is going on among, amongst wine growers throughout the world these days, who are increasingly using biodynamic methods because they are simply finding that it improves uh, the quality and the flavor of their wines. And it has also been found that when you use biodynamic compost on the soil, you enhance the capacity of the soil to increase uh, its, its carbon. So there is good reason based on emerge, an emerging body of science to suggest that the biodynamic methods, which are a sort of higher level of organic farming, are part of the solution. So that's certainly something that people who are interested in true cost accounting can do. They can purchase organic and biodynamic food uh, because those systems of production are actually using the market mechanism to address some of these negative costs that I've been speaking about. Thank you again, Patrick. Uh, the next question uh, reads, cheap food, like all cheap goods, dominate the market because of cheap labor. Do you think that this is the major social externality to solve? Fair pay, a high minimum wage, would allow the ma majority of consumers to switch to sustainable food? Well, the, the labor issue 
uh, of course, is both sides of the farm gate. Uh, paying people too little money to afford good food is part of the problem, but also we have an economic underclass, Hispanic labor mainly in the US, but in the European Union, we have the equivalent of Eastern European economic mi migrants on whom we rely to grow, pick, and process the majority of the food which is now purchased in supermarkets. And this really is a scandal, it's a social scandal, it's a, an abuse of human rights, arguably, to pay people uh, such low wages for working on the land. So we, when we buy this cheap food, we're complicit in the problem. And then, of course, the underclass of people who are not paid sufficiently well, um, who don't work in agriculture, also have income issues and are unable to afford afford food which will really promote their health and the health of those family, their families. And a man who's championed this cause, for whom I have enormous admiration, is Eric Schlosser, who wrote Fast Food Nation and who continues to be a great campaigner for the rights of agricultural workers. And um, his, his film, and uh, of course the film Food Inc., which he did with Michael Pollan, is worth watching if you haven't already seen that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you believe legislation that helps farmers produce sustainably is more effective than punitive legislation that, for producers who utilize unsustainable means? Uh, well, I think legislation is part of the toolkit of measures which need to be taken to make sustainable farming and food produced by sustainable farming more affordable and uh, intensive farming more uh, accountable economically uh, for the damage caused. So I think it'll take a mixture of voluntary measures, government measures, redirection of subsidies, I mentioned insurance as well earlier. I don't think it's one single piece of action which will uh, correct these distortions, but a lot of it will be driven just by awareness. And if you become aware, for instance, that when you're buying food which seems cheap, it isn't really cheap at all, and you know why, that is the case, then I think uh, we'll find ways of redirecting the, uh, the taxes and the incentives in such a way that if you do the right thing, you benefit, and if you do the wrong thing, you have to pay. Great, and this question comes from a farmer. Uh, he asks, as a farmer yourself, what advice would you give me and other farmers listening today? How can we make our voices and the challenges we face louder? That's a very good question. Um, I mentioned earlier that I think it, in the end it boils down to informed public opinion. So I think we all, as farmers, we all have to be advocates uh, for this, uh, the adoption of this new full cost accounting, true cost accounting uh, campaign. Uh, we need to, if we're selling food directly to customers, we need to explain to them what's going on. And we just need to get the word out as widely as possible. And I also think in doing so, we need to reach out to farmers who are currently growing, let's say, Roundup Ready corn and soy, which most farmers in the Midwest are having to do because that's the best business case. And we mustn't see them as part of the problem. We need to see them as being trapped in an economic system whereby if they try to do what, for instance, I'm doing, they probably need a day job to stay in business. And you can't blame a farmer for wanting to stay in business. In fact, many small family farms are disappearing at the moment. So we need to find a way in which the economics of sustainable agriculture become sufficiently viable for a much wider uptake. And I think anybody who's listening to this who has any insight, personal, in, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a grower or anybody who's thinking about these issues should do your utmost to communicate this, these ideas as widely as possible, especially uh, to express your view uh, as, a, as an elector, as a, as a member of the electorate, because your voting power counts. And in the end, what we're going to have to do is to mobilize a sufficient body of, of public opinion to make Obama feel the heat in a positive way, or whoever follows Obama, uh, regardless of what their party is, because that's way, the way that some of the uh, subsidies and incentives will get redirected eventually. I mean, it is a scandal at the moment, the way the farm bill is spent in such a way that it is directly damaging to public health in America and to the environment, uh, all because of uh, the enormously strong lobbies 
of the agrochemical and agribusiness interests, which you can understand, they're just part of, uh, part of life, but we have to be the, the larger force and eventually overwhelm them. Thanks again, Patrick. Uh, and the next question, I think you kind of started to, to answer it a little bit. Uh, how can we send this message to consumers and make them feel comfortable paying more for sustainably produced food, or uh, is that the way the direction's going? Yeah, it's, uh, up until now, that has been the only option that we've had. As I explained right at the top of what I said, that if you put the whole price, the price that we are paying, let's say, take my own personal example, I'm a dairy farmer, we're getting paid um, about 40 pence, just over 40 pence a litre for our milk. Uh, that is the price actually that a company called Rachel's Dairy uh, based quite close to us in Aberystwyth is paying its farmers, although of course we're then making our milk into cheese, so we get a higher price for our cheese, which helps us stay in business. But we need to think about uh, the pricing system uh, as being having to take all the difference. At the moment, uh, dairy farming is in a real mess in the UK, with conventional dairy farmers getting as little as 25 pence a litre, even less than that in some cases. And that is below the cost of production, as a result of which small dairy, dairy uh, family dairy farms are just giving up. Apparently there are going to be there are 10,000 dairy farms left in the UK, and a thousand of them are going to disappear this year because farmers are getting less than the cost of production. Now this is a, a social scandal, it's, a, it's really uh, a, a, a catastrophe because we're losing the cultural background of sustainable agriculture which won't be easily replaced. So we really need to find ways in which the price needs to be put uh, into other areas so that uh, farmers like myself don't have to charge such a large premium to be able to stay in business. And that's all about an educational process, in, as I've just explained. Great. And I think we'll just wrap up with this question this morning or this afternoon for you. Uh, what is the number one thing the listener can take away today, whether that is newly acquired knowledge or an action step to take in their own lives? Well, if you're already purchasing sustainably produced food, uh, pat yourself on the back because you're doing the right thing and you're exercising your right and your ability to influence change by using some of your disposable income, perhaps more than would be ideal, to compensate for the absence of true cost accounting. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that you should continue to do that. Buy food with a story that you know. Um, with the best possible environmental and health outcomes because in the long term you will save uh, on your family's health, you will save expensive health treatment costs and you will be saving the planet as well. But in the meantime, do everything you can to spread awareness of this issue as widely as possible. Talk about it, it's interesting, think about it, follow it up. Follow Food Tank, who are going to be doing more research on this. Follow the Sustainable Food Trust. We have a weekly newsletter. Please subscribe to that. We will be carrying this information on an ongoing basis. Um, an educated citizen is a citizen that is empowered to help change the world. And we need you to get involved with this campaign. Amazing. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thank you to all of our listeners for sending in their questions today. It was truly a pre pleasure. Uh, and I just want to let everyone know to stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be posted on foodtank.com. And our webinar with Patrick today will be posted later today. So thank you again for participating. It was truly an honor to have you, Patrick, and have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Bye.